have a question for you. Do we go for truth or do we go for ratings? You know, we get a lot of stuff on the on the TV or whatever, and they got to be the first ones, you know, out there with great breaking news. And it may not always be true. We just had an incident not this past week where there was a, a massacre up in Ohio, then the first thing came out and said that seven people were killed and included two two children. Well, to come out, there was eight people killed and the children didn't get hurt, but the, which is good, you know. But we need to be careful what we do uh, come up with. How many times have you heard someone say something or thus and such, and when asked if they know it's true or how they know it's true, they say, well, it's got to be true. I got it off the Internet. Yeah, right. Or so-and-so told me. Remember, just to be first, to blurt out or repeat something not knowing whether it is true or not, to get ratings or acknowledgement, assuming this is true, can be a major mistake in our lives and have very severe, possibly even deadly consequences for those people involved. <clears throat> Proverbs 18.17 tells us, the first one to plead their cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him or questions him. Then we have the he said, she said. We find this especially in domestic disputes and criminal investigations. But most likely, these kind of situations will involve people and witnesses being questioned separately as to not murk the information to, ter to determine what actually did happen. Proverbs 11, 9, 9. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge and righteousness will be delivered. To go down in verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. We have a council of elders in our church. And I appreciate that because it that keeps a lot of misinformation going out to people. You know, they catch it before it goes out. And that, that's why we did that. Deuteronomy 17.6, if you want to turn there. I have it in my notes, but says, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil among you. There was a case of the woman that was talking taken before Jesus Christ that was caught in the, the act of adultery. And he says, Though whoever is without sins, throw the first stone. And one by one they walked off. And finally there was nobody left. And he asked her, he says, where are those that are accused you? He didn't condemn her. He didn't condone her either. He just said, go and sin no more. But they acknowledged the fact that they were just as sinful as she was. So they couldn't cast that first stone. This is not always the case, though. Sometimes you have those with unsavory character claiming to be truthful witnesses. And we've all seen that. Deuteronomy 19.15-20 through 20 shows some safeguards that were put in place. Verse 15 one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouths of two or three witnesses. The matter shall be established. Talk about it. You, you sort it out. Verse 16, a false witness, if a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord. 
before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness, who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil among you. I'll guarantee you a few times of doing that, they probably wouldn't do it very often, you know. And, then, and those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such an evil among you. Every year there are untold numbers of people who are convicted or incarcerated due to false testimony or false accusations of unscrupulous people or the lack of exonerating evidence. Sometimes they plead guilty. One of two reasons. For they don't have the financial ability or the mental capacity to battle the charges against them. There's a, there is a project or an organization called the Innocence Project. Have anybody heard that about that here? Yeah. An organization that is very involved in seeing that people who have been falsely accused of or lack the or the lack or the refusal of the presentation of evidence to prove themselves innocent and acquitted and set free. Many, if not most of these cases, after many years in prison, sometimes 20, 30 years, maybe even longer, and a number of them on death row. The Innocence Project is a non private legal organization that is committed to exonerating wrongfully convicted people through the use of DNA testing and the processing of evidence and reforming the criminal justice system to prevent future injustice. The Innocence Project was founded in 1992 by Barry Sheck, I think we, most of us have heard of him, he's a famous lawyer, and Barry Neufeld, or Peter Neufeld. To date, the work of the Innocence Project has led to the freeing of more than 330 wrongfully convicted people, including 20 who spent time on death row. Can you imagine what's going on in those people's mind is sitting there on death row? When's it going to happen? Am I going to get out of this? Can somebody help me? Can you think of one of the most and best known persons that has been tried, convicted, sentenced to die, and did so in the history of mankind. Any guesses? No, I think so. Due to the false testimony or witnesses of two witnesses. I'm sure that you can. It's Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yes, this is true, and I did not get it off the Internet. Imagine that. But I rather, out of God's own word, the Holy Bible, false witness accused Jesus, and he was sentenced to die. Let's go for the story to Matthew 26. If you want to go there, I have it here. But I'll begin in, 50, in verse 57 for the story. And those who had laid hands, hold, and those who laid hold of Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. In other words, he wanted to see what was going to happen. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forth, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? That Jesus, what did he do? He kept, he, he kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Whose living God was it? I mean, it was, <laughs> tell us if you are the Christ the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, the high priest, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand on the, of, on, on the power. 
coming in the clouds of heaven, and then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Verse 67, And they sped in his face, and beat him, and others struck him in the palms of their hands. Brethren, we need to cooperate and verify and go to the source. Yes, Jesus Christ was crucified, as was prophesied. Still the women that came to the tomb needed assurance of what he had told them in Luke 24, verse 1. One through eight. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices, which spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone was rolled away, rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they, the men, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember? Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered the words. See, they just needed a reminder. Then we have Doubting Thomas. Sometimes we think of Doubting Thomas in a sort of a negative way, but it's, it's not really. It's just he had to prove something. Said, then we have doubting Thomas, John 20, beginning in verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the prints of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples again were inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came in, into the door, and the doors being shut, stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger in here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand in here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That includes us in this room. We haven't seen him, but we believe. Because it is God's word. We believe God's word. And it was recorded for our benefit. Brethren, we cannot afford to take what we hear for granted or just on hearsay. Find the truth of the matter and ask questions. Just as Thomas and the women who, who found the tomb of Jesus empty, this is not only our right, but it's our duty. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 we, we are to test or prove all things. Let us remember that yesterday was the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Passover season representing Jesus, or Israel coming out of Egypt and our coming out of sin. Yes, Christ died for our sins to be forgiven, but was raised by the Father so we can be lifted up to eternal life in his kingdom at, the, at his return, at that last trumpet. So brethren, keep praying. Thy kingdom come and they will be done on earth as in heaven. Mm -hmm.